data in mobile networks, mobile telephone networks. I think we have a very interesting panel for you with very interesting people to speak on this issue. Um, we will talk about location data in mobile phone networks, particularly GSM networks. Um, this session will be about privacy design of those networks, or let me say, the lack of privacy designs of the networks. It will be about security issues. It will be about the role of law enforcement uh, in their interest in location data to track the geographical whereabouts of people. Uh, we will look at the, what the future might bring concerning UTMS networks and beyond. Are they are better designed from a privacy perspective uh, or is it even getting worse? Um, we will also look at the role of um, location data um, as far as they are looked upon by people who make laws and treaties and who um, deal with location data as it were traffic data. And we will try to make a point that location data is a special um, a special collection of traffic data that should have more protection than a normal traffic data. So it should be at the level of protection somewhere in between content data and traffic data. Let me introduce the speakers to you. Um, I'm chairing the panel. My name is Maurice Wesling. I work for an Amsterdam-based privacy and civil liberties group called Bits of Freedom. Our first speaker will be um, Paul Wienesse. Um Paul has a career of working at uh, KPMG um, and Bcash. Um, and he has a long history in new media, being one of the co-founders of the Hectic magazine. Uh, this, this festival is partly coming from the Hectic uh, history. Um, he worked at Webnet, uh, at uh, Euro, SCRC Interactive, and uh, at ITSX, a security company in Amsterdam. Uh, and is uh, at this moment working for an Amsterdam-based company called Maptif, who, uh, well, what they do is better than the expansion. After that, we will have uh, Frank Rieger of the Chaos Computer Club in Berlin. Uh, Frank has been a speaker for the German um, Chaos Computer Club for several years and has uh, especially focused on uh, information warfare and intelligence and crypto politics. And currently he is working for a company called Gate5 who are developing applications uh, on the basis of GSM location data. Then we'll have uh, Jaap Henk Hoekman who is working here at this university as an assistant professor. And he's a researcher in cryptography security and um, he's also doing funny projects like a Java-based mind mapping tool, whatever that may be. Um, and our last speaker will be Gus Hussein. Uh, Gus is a, is a fellow at uh, the London School of Economics. And he is lecturing there on privacy, on uh, philosophy, on the politics of technology, on um, the concept of information society. And in his spare time he is working for Privacy International, which is a privacy and civil liberties organization based in London. Okay, let me first give the microphone to Paul Dinesen. I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Maurice. Let me switch on my laptop. We... I hope it's possible to see over there. Thank you for inviting me uh, for this panel. And I will give you a very brief introduction um, on what we can expect from location-based services. And the other speakers will take a call. Uh, go into more detail on any of the subjects that you can, uh, can imagine here. Well, the introduction already had. My name is Paul Dinesen, 
and I was probably asked here for my role in, in Hectic in the early days, and I worked a couple of years for DigiCash um, because I was very fascinated with the privacy enhancing technologies that David Chow uh, developed. And I'm also invited because of what I'm doing today, and that's for a company called Maptiv, uh, which I founded together with a couple of friends about a year ago. And that's focusing on mobile internet. What we believe is that mobile internet is going to be a huge success, but there's one very, um, there's one thing that's very important. And that's we believe that the device should do what the end user wants the device to do, and that the end user should actually be in control uh, on on what its device is doing. So what we do is we develop techniques and we license, we develop software and we license it to customers that empowers the end user to do just that. Today we're not really involved in location-based services um, at, the, at the moment. We are doing some kind of enhanced bookmarking, but it's the, next, the logical next step because we expect that the end users will want their mobile files to behave differently based on, on, on different situations, based on time, based on uh, where they are, based on location. So that's one of the things. And we see it as one of our challenges to actually develop technology that enables easy access for the end user to all kinds of services um, under the conditions that he thinks that should apply. Also with respect, sorry, with uh, respect to price. So what kind of location-based services do we expect? What, 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 what can we expect? Well, first there's a category of what we call uh, cool services. They're not that privacy invasive, but just to give you an idea of what those services could be. Um, the travel directions is an obvious one. I think most of you will read that. that. That will be the idea that a lot of people already have. You could use that. You, go, you could go a bit uh, a step further. Uh, taxi hailing. Uh, I'm here, and maybe there's a taxi in the street, uh, two streets away. Maybe that's, that's my taxi. Maybe that's the taxi that, that I want. Mobile yellow pages. I just bought my tent, but I, I still uh, need a piece of plastic to put under it because it's, it's kind of wet here. Um, I have to find it in Enschede. It, it would be handy if my mobile device would be uh, uh, could give me data uh, location. Sorry, uh, could give me data which was uh, yeah, nearby here that I don't get the, the tent shop in Amsterdam. All kinds of buying services will happen. Uh, in Finland, they have an interesting trial uh, right now in the stadium where people can actually order their drinks and their fast food while they're sitting in the stadium. And it's, and it's actually working because the people, uh, it's working for the people in the stadium because at halftime, when there's a 15 minute break, all the people want their hamburgers and all the people want their snacks. Uh, it's, it's, it's simply not working. It's not working for the people in the stadium and it's also not working for, for the people who are doing the catering over there. Right now, people can use their mobile, their mobile phone to, to order and actually also pay for, for their fast, for the fast food and for their snacks. And it's actually brought to them by, um, uh, to their seats. And other instant information. Where it's getting more um, privacy intrusive is for all kinds of push services. Um, the sheets are really hard to, to read right now. Um, there, there are good push services, but there are also very good services that we found that, that can be very intrusive. Of course, we can imagine the mobile advertisements. I'm walking in the streets and on every corner I get spammed by the latest uh, deals that, that people could have for me. Um, but there are also uh, some examples already happening today, not GSM based, um, that give an idea or give some insight of, of, of the threats that we could have to, uh, towards privacy. One of them is Friend Finders, which is actually operating in Finland and in Japan. It's possible to track your, your, your family, uh, your, your, your friends, etc. People who subscribe to the service, they can get an alert when one of their friends from their group is getting nearby. Uh, if they are within a couple of hundred meters or a mile away, they get a signal. And 
people subscribe to that, people pay for that, people think it's funny. Um, it could be funny. Uh, the service is also used by parents who want to know where their kids are. Is my kid at school? Did it arrive at school safely? Is it, is it already at home, yes or no? Okay, there are some functionality there, but I think we all see the threat that it would bring to privacy if, uh, if it was used for other services. Another scenario that we see is uh, what they call zone alerts. It's, it's quite similar, but it's actually used to, to monitor people uh, where they are and whether they stay in a certain area, yes or no. It's already implemented for a group of Alzheimer patients uh, who are strictly monitored. And if they leave their house too far, actually some caretaker is notified that the Alzheimer patient is running away again. And of course, again, this could be a very useful functionality. But again, we all see the, 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 the threats that it would bring to privacy. These are just a few examples of, of services that already exist today. And just two weeks ago, um, a report was, uh, was released um, where they, did, they, where they asked a, a large group in the US, about uh, 13,000 people actually responded. Uh, to what they think, what, the, what their consumer opinion is of location-based services and privacy. And there were four key findings in that report. And the good news is that indeed many people uh, are concerned about the potential impact of location-based services on privacy. And privacy concerns include the potential threats to personal security and use of personal location records for commercial purposes and legal action. And uh, the respondents emphasized that the importance of being able to control who receives their information. So that, that idea, that concept is, is, is really uh, in their heads. And that, I think that's a good, a good thing. And consumers have strong views on actions required by the wireless carriers and location-based service providers that would greatly reduce their concerns about privacy. So people have all kinds of ideas what their service providers should do to make sure that, the, um, that their privacy is more secure. So that's what the people think about it. What's the statement of the European Commission at the moment? Well, the European Commission has made clear that it does not intend to interfere with uh, individual companies as long as the positioning information is only used for the reason where it was originally given for. Um, Mr. Pereira, one of the scientific officers at DJ13, uh, stated explicitly that privacy concerns will make or break this industry. So they're very aware of the importance of privacy and location-based services. My last slide, however, is a remark that Gartner made towards the privacy laws that are now in place uh, in, in, Almost, and in other countries, one of the speakers knows much more about it than I do. Um, but the uncontrolled availability of personal, person location information uh, well, presents a serious risk to individual privacy. But it's not entirely clear that, that current privacy laws uh, and practices will actually protect the users. This is for the simple reason that people know uh, the information is about telephone numbers, telephone IDs, but it's not about the individual and the name, the person who's actually behind it. And that's one of the threats uh, that, that is actually in place now. I'm sure that in the panel this will be one of the things that we will explore uh, further together with the other speakers. And I'll give the microphone now to, to Frank, who's going to tell more about his part. Hello. Um. Um, I'm from Riga, um, I'm from Germany, so the, um, the things that I will talk about are, are more or less from a German perspective. Um, the company I work for that I founded with um, does technologies and applications for people that want to do specifically that kind of applications. Um, that has been talked about, it means finding friends or finding an finding, uh, next person and whatever. Um, what I want to talk about is more or less the, the, the technical groundwork of the locationing scene. So giving a brief, a brief overview about 
uh, what kind of technology is already in the network, what we will have to expect in the next one to two years, and what are the key drivers that, that are bringing forward the technology. Um, okay, the display is not much use, but okay. <laughs> Um, the, um, the main thing that, that you need to understand is how the tech, that industry works. Um, we have a group of mobile operators that own the GSM networks. All these operators, or most of these operators, uh, have huge debts for UMTS and they need to do something about it and to provide some, some kind of application that will convince users to pay much more than they pay today for, on their mobile phone bill. And since the, the prices for voice over uh, mobile phones is already declining massively, um, the only option that they have is bringing these users to services that they like. And of course, most of these services will be location-based because the opportunity is there. Um, so the operators own the network, and they invest in the infrastructure also on the network side for locationing. That means that they want to get profit from that locationing. Um, on the other hand, um, they don't want to run these services themselves, most of the operators. Some operators say, okay, we are going into that, into that application business and say, okay, I run a friend finder as whatever, Belga.com friend finder or whatever. Um, most of the bigger operators say, okay, we just want to be something like an, yeah, a gardener that has something, a lot of blossoms on the, on the field and uh, some of these uh, content providers will die and some will make it. And we don't want to have the risk of determining what kind of application is risky and what not. So that brings them in an interesting position. They own the location data, they own the customer data, and they determine what kind of data is being provided to independent content, uh, content providers. Um, these independent content providers um, will, in the end, be the majority of companies providing these location-based services. They have their own interest, their own profit structure that is mostly independent from, from the profit structure of the GSM operator. So. Um, then there's a third group in the market is technology providers. Um, that's for instance my company and a lot of other uh, companies that are buying technology, uh, that are buying uh, and aggregating technology or writing software themselves and selling them to the independent uh, content providers or to the operators. Um, the key driver in the market besides that uh, UMTS scene is the 9-11 requirement in the US. Um, there's a law that uh, says that uh, beginning 2002, uh, the majority of phones sold in the US has to, to, uh, to include a locationing device that enables the 911, that's the rescue services there, to find a mobile phone with an accuracy of, I think, 150 meters. Um, the deadline has now been prolonged a little bit because uh, technology hasn't developed as far as they hope. But uh, in the end, there will be no phones sold in the US that have no locationing provision. Um, and if this provision is in there for 9-11, so why don't use it for purposes? So they do that. Um, one, one thing that I can talk only about for the German market, because that's the market that I know of, um, is that how anonymous is the customer data? Um, the normal uh, procedure when I'm an independent content operator or a provider, and I want to do something like a friend finder, is that I send a request to the, uh, to the mobile operator and uh, get a location back. And that request is not based on the phone number but on, on some kind of pseudonymous ID. The, the location in infrastructure has been set up at this moment for things like what, because that's what the operators betted on and lost. And um, so they, they, what they're trying to do is uh, you're calling up with your what phone your call is being forwarded through the infrastructure of the, of the mobile operator. And um, at some point in the infrastructure, the base station inserts its number, its identification, into the caller ID stream that is then being forwarded through the network operator's infrastructure, calculated into a position and forwarded to the, uh, to, uh, to the independent content provider. And uh, on the way there, the caller ID is replaced by a number that is unique for the customer. It's always the same. Every time I call it, my independent content provider gets the same number, but it's not my phone number. The reason for that is twofold. That setup is something like an impromptu agreement that the operators in Germany have done with the, uh, the, with the privacy um, uh, law people, um, the Datenschutzbeauftragten, um, because 
at this moment, there is no privacy law in Europe that covers location in data and mobile, and mobile phone systems. So there is simply no law. So they did some sort of agreement saying, okay, let's try this anonymization or pseudonymization and uh, let's see if it works. And uh, at this moment, there is a, is a, uh, an, a law novel in, uh, in the Bundestag where they're trying to, to uh, modify that law, but it will take a long way. Um, the, the supplementing that measure for, for the uh, independent contact, uh, contact provider is very easy. It just needs to ask at one point in the transaction for the phone number of the, of the customer. And uh, believe me, most people will just type, type in their phone number. And at this moment, the independent contact provider can associate the pseudonym that he gets from the, from the operator and uh, uh, the phone number that he gets from the customer and there he has a match. That's very easy. Um, the operators are data greedy. They want to own the customer. That's part of their business plan is uh, they want to have as much customer data as possible and want to give away as little customer data as possible. They are in a little bit of difficult situation because on one hand they don't want to have the risk of running these, all these mobile applications and on the other hand they want to own the customer and don't give away too much data or too much profit to the independent content provider. Um, so uh, in the end what the operators say is, okay, we are your operator and we already know where you are because <coughs> we have all this network infrastructure, we have all these records and we know everything about you, we have all your call records. So you need to trust us, the operator, anyway. So just trust us with your location and data too and everything will be fine. That's the implicit argument of the operators. And uh, they, they don't want to have the customer too much control about, the, uh, about his location and data. On the other hand, uh, they know that, especially in Europe, there is a, a great privacy sensitivity with, within their customer base, and so they, they can't do everything. Okay, what we have in the networks today is cell ID. That's what basically every operator in Europe uh, has to offer. Um, cell ID uh, is not only the number of the cell that you're booked in with a telephone, um, but an identification number that describes the area of coverage that is being covered by one antenna of the base station. So typically you have a setup where you have four to six to seven antennas that are covering uh, areas and you can say okay this customer is in the area served by this antenna and you get the, uh, if, you, if you're an independent service uh, uh, contact provider uh, you're getting the position of that cell. That means uh, there's an area that is covered by that and, and they calculate the middle of that, and that's the position you get. And <coughs> the problem, problem with that technique is it's not very precise. So it depends on the, uh, on the coverage size of the cell. Um, you get between 300 meters and 5 kilometers, depending on, on how big the cell is. If you are really in a countryside, it could even be that it's 20 kilometers accuracy. So, <laughs> yeah, not very useful. Um, on the other hand, pizza, pizza shops are not den that dense in the, in the countryside either, so 20 kilometers would be fine. Um, the, the, uh, that's the only, only system that is available to that, uh, today in the wild. That's what, what you can, can use if you're, if you're doing all these friend finder and uh, 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 all that stuff. Um, because it's the only system that doesn't require any investments in network infrastructure, or only very small software changes. Um, the next group of technologies, I have to say, it's a little bit more complicated, they've simplified it here, um, is time of arrival. Um, there they use the cell ID, plus uh, they use timing signals from the mobile phone. That means uh, they measure the time, how long it, uh, the, the signal travels between the uh, telephone and, uh, and the base station and can therefore determine how far the telephone is away from the base station. So they know in what, what kind of cell the telephone is and they know how far it is away from the base station. And uh, doing, doing some other measurements on the, on the phases of the signal and stuff like that, they can get down to about 50 meters accuracy. I haven't seen that really, dark, uh, really yet, but uh, that's what the, the, the vendors that uh, do that kind of technology claim. Um, time of arrival has the problem that it uh, requires heavy investments in the network infrastructure because you need to upgrade every base station. It cannot be, cannot be done with, with some kind of central software upgrade somewhere in, in some computer, but they need to really go to every base station, pl plug in some new boards, plug in some new software. It's really a costly investment. <coughs> the, um, the next thing is what you would think is obvious. That's what, what 
a hacker would do that is triangulation. So uh, every telephone in most in most cases doesn't see only one cell where it's booked in, but several cells, and it just uses the one that has uh, the best uh, the best power for a power level for the telephone. So um, if you use the, the, the timing signal and the signal strings um, from several cells, you can triangulate uh, via simple mathematics or relatively simple mathematics uh, where the telephone is approximately about. Um, this requires even more and, and higher investments into the network infrastructure. Um, it also requires um, a change in software on the telephone um, because you need some, something to work in the telephone uh, to simplify the process. And uh, the difficulty is that it, uh, it's not easy to bring that technology up to a massive scale because um, the calculation involved and uh, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, transmissions involved from the telephone to the network and back uh, is quite high. And so <coughs> initial calculations for the bigger operators have said uh, that it's nearly impossible to, to bring triangulation up to a scale we can say, okay, track 20 million users at a time. So that, that's a significantly software engineering problem. Okay, um, the, the trials that have been done are also going down to 50 meters of currency depending on all kinds of stuff like reflection on buildings, like weather, like uh, if it's uh, autumn or, or, or winter because of the leaves on the, on the trees and all kinds of stuff. Um, one thing that is quite popular in the US um, is assisted uh, GPS, one of the products, uh, SnapTrack. What they're doing is they're building a very simple G uh, GPS. I assume see the GPS is known as a technology that's a global positioning system, satellite-based uh, location system where the timing signal from, uh, from satellites is being used to calculate the position on Earth. And um, what they're doing is they have a very simple G uh, GPS receiver that just takes a, it takes a snapshot of the sky and the signal from, from the satellites that it sees and doesn't do any fancy calculations on that, but uh, compresses the data that he gets, puts in some uh, some data that uh, comes from the, from the GSM network and sends this data package to the operator um, and the operator can calculate from that from that uh, data set a quite precise uh, uh, position. Um, the, this system um, combines both worlds. It requires an, uh, quite a relatively high investment in new telephones because you need a new GPS uh, assisted telephone and uh, that's not what to, is today in the market. There is only very few prototypes of that. And cost is not really an issue because GPS chips are getting dirt cheap now. The, the, if you're buying really quantity like one million chips, you're getting uh, good GPS chips for below $20. So that, that's not an issue anymore for the telephones. Um, the, the accuracy that you can get there is about 10 meters. That's what they say. And that's also depending on a lot of factors. It's not like you have everywhere 10 meters where you, where you work. But uh, it depends on view of the sky, reflections on, on buildings, and, and stuff like that. Um, okay. Uh, the beauty of that uh, system is that it requires comparatively little investment in the networks because you just need one, one central server that uh, does the computation of the locationing uh, and uh, okay, the, the computation on the telephone. Um, what we have today in Europe is the small operators. Um, have mostly called independent locationing up and running. It means you don't need to set up a data call or a web call or whatever uh, to get a, a position, but the, uh, the independent content provider or you, if you have lost your telephone, that's the typical service that is being offered at this moment, um, can go to the website and say, I'm that guy, um, I want to know uh, where my telephone is, and you get a uh, cell ID based location from the, uh, from the telephone. The bigger operators, um, have too much focus on that and uh, have at this moment this, uh, this call-based uh, locationing that means that they need to uh, and set up data call so they can insert the cell ID in the, in the data stream um, to, to, to get your location. So at this moment the small operators are a little bit faster. What you can expect is that uh, with the uh, introduction of GPRS into the networks and with uh, the beginnings of UNTS in, in the networks, uh, we will see much more investment into the, into the locationing technologies. Um, GPRS is more or less a trial for UMTS. What they, what they want to, to, to try out is, is how users uh, do users react to the location technology, how you, do users react to new end user devices that have location capabilities, and all these uh, uh, privacy, uh, privacy aspects. Okay, That's, that was my talk. So if, I, if I was to force to have any questions, so probably later then.